very good afternoon uh, oh. viewers ladies and gentlemen i can hear you first of all i this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to the organizers for extending me this privilege and honor to be a guest on this web platform in fact uh, the uh, university has shown me extreme kindness and i am truly grateful when i was approached by the organizer to deliver a talk webinar program my choice told that i can select my topic of my interest i purposely actually chose rather than any actually topic of legal interest i thought the advocacy would be best suited for two reasons primarily in the profession we always in fact right from day one we learn and till we end our career we continue to learn so therefore art of adv advocacy is something which we keep practicing every day in and out and secondly some of the potential lawyers that is law students in fact they must know what are the fundamentals of advocacy so that as they grow in their profession they would be in a better position to assimilate things and then they would be in a better position to become a good advocate having said this let me put the subject of the art of advocacy in context we all know advocacy all over the world that is every nation every community without exception has produced outstanding advocates there have been outstanding advocates there are outstanding judges there have been outstanding jurists if you dig little deeper into history way back in bc 385 there was a, there was a great orator called demosthenes you all might have heard of him what he used to do put pebbles in his mouth go and speak on the sea shore so that his voice could be heard and he is not drowned by the noise of the waves such was his appreciation that to become a powerful orator you need a voice which should be heard and you all know that voice is a very important weapon for the advocate and if the weapon is lost the voice is not heard at all now having said this let us see our own nation has produced outstanding jurists and advocates and judges the nation mahatma gandhi the first prime minister late pandit jawaharlal nehru the architect the architect of the indian constitution dr ambedkar they are all in fact outstanding advocates and similarly we had outstanding professionals we had ck dafri the attorney general of india for a very number very number of years we had mr satulwad then we had mr nani palkiwala and mr fali nariman and mr soli sarab ji and the current attorney general mr k k venugopal they are all legends both both past and present the list is endless and similarly we talk of judges there are outstanding judges justice krishnaya justice p n bhagavati justice chandrachur for profession of law all these people could achieve the pinnacle of their career by sheer hard work and they could master the art of advocacy now let me actually bring forward as to what is art of advocacy would mean it is an art it's not a science and when i say advocacy if i may simply put it actually an art of persuasion four important principles which was just now mentioned they are fundamentals to advocacy one effective reading two effective writing three effective speaking and four effective listening you all must be wondering as to why the word effective is added to all these words reading writing speaking and listening we all read books we all read novels we all read judgments that may be for pleasure of reading it could be for pleasure of knowledge enriching oneself or it could be an hobby 
as a lawyer, as a professional, you have to do effective reading, you have to do effective writing, you have to do effective speaking, and you have to be effective in listening as well. Because I will shortly actually take on each one of them. It carries a lot of meaning. And coming back to the art of advocacy, I would like to actually quote what our Supreme Court said way back about three decades back in P. N. Ishura here and others versus Registrar Supreme Court of India. This is reported in 1980, Volume 4, SEC, page 680. I quote. <laughs> Para 29A at page 692, what Supreme Court says about advocacy, art of advocacy. Experience has shown that at all levels, the bar through the spoken word and the written brief has aided the process of judicial justice. Advocacy is an art, even as advocacy is an art. Happy interaction between the two makes for the functional fulfillment of the court system. Again, in para 37, I quote, our judicial culture nourishes oral advocacy and public hearing since secret celebrations and cabal delib deliberations are ordinarily anitma. Speaking generally, oral advocacy is a decisive art in promoting justice. The bench cannot dispense with the bar in our system of advocacy, in our system, advocacy becomes functional when presented by Wabos and is enfeebled if presented in muted print, unquote. So therefore, the Supreme Court has recognized that the art of advocacy, along with justicing, are the fundamentals in the administration of justice. Now, I said that there are four fundamentals, effective speaking, effective listening, effective reading, and effective writing. When we talk of reading and writing, what an advocate actually does, he sits with his client, he understands the grievance that the client has, and starts reducing it into a form of writing. So you listen to your client, you are actually gathering the facts as to what the client is putting, putting forward. So therefore, the first thing that you require when you actually begin your practice or even during the course of your practice that you have to be a complete master of the facts that you can get it only from your client whether in the form of oral presentation or in the form of the documents that the client has provided to you you actually go through them and try and master the facts then thereafter you decide as to what is the relief through a court of law that you can actually get for your client. And also, who are the parties against whom actually the suit or the petition is to be filed. Then also there is something known as, you all would have heard, a cause of action. Now, you collect all this material, make up a case, and then present it before a court of law in the form of pleadings. You put in facts, you put in documents, you put in grounds, the legal grounds, through which actually you want the relief to be given to your client, and then you have prayer, and then you have cause of action. So pleading forms the first essential part of advocacy. So far as the pleadings are concerned, one thing you always bear in mind, the documents are going to be the foundation of the case. So therefore, any mistake that you commit, or anything which you overlook, can be very, very costly and detrimental at a later point of time. Because one thing you always remember, the same brief or the same case, which when it is filed in the court, is also available with the opponent, is available to the opposite counsel. He also reads the same brief. You are also reading the same brief. So therefore, the rest points, the points, the points which are actually, which you may think, or which one advocate may think that it is a cast iron point, it is not likely to let him down. We do not know when it goes before the court and when the trial begins, how it is to be taken or during the course of arguments, how it is going to be addressed. So therefore, 
going through the documents and going through the pleadings is a very important aspect of towards advocacy. Then comes the art of speaking. Now, when I say art of speaking, it's very important whether it is a civil case or a criminal case, whatever it may be, the advocate is acting for, ex, for his client. So therefore, advocate has a dual role. One, towards the court. And second, more importantly, towards his client. Because undoubtedly, the advocate has a huge responsibility because he has to advance the case of his client. However unpopular it may be, the best way that you actually present, then only you can actually hope to get some relief from the court. So therefore, the all important aspect of actually knowing the facts, then your duty towards the court and also duty towards the client, both have to be balanced. Now here, let me actually touch upon the aspect of institutional respect. Now we all as lawyers, and tomorrow, actually, the students who are on the threshold of getting into the profession, we all actually would come. To there is a mutual give and take in the sense that you have to respect the court, you have to respect the judge, and the judge also respects the advocate. Something like a chariot where both the wheels have to go together. Then only you would be in a position to put the case of your client the best possible manner that one can actually think of. Ultimately, the judge is the master of the ceremonies. Whatever we are going to actually place it before and countered by the other side, the judge is ultimately going to go through both and then eventually will give a judgment both on facts and law. Now, such being the position, your responsibility towards the court and to yourself, there is an institutional respect Rather, it's a mutual respect. We all come across actually cases, instances, where at times the advocates are very, very argumentative, where they actually, for the sake of arguing, or just because the point of view is not accepted, they may go in the matter. But that may do more harm to the client rather than doing anything good to the case. Of course, judicial objective is different. The judge listens to both of you that is both the parties, then applies the law and the facts, and then ultimately actually determines the dispute. One important aspect of advocacy is more personal, it is the individual skill of the advocate, so the different techniques that one actually laces up consistent with the character and personality with which we have been brought up. In other words, when I say, the individual skill and the personal touch matters a lot in advocacy. After all, we don't get trained to be like others. You have your own character. You have your own personality. You, hold, you have your own style and skill. All these things, they go to, go to make up how you present your case before a court. Let me give a small example. The medical profession, let me take actually a comparison with the medical profession. Supposing somebody actually has to undergo a surgery, so you consult the best of doctors in that particular field, go to him. Now, when you go to a doctor, he has got his own characteristics and personal skills. He takes care of his patients. The way actually arrangements are done, both pre-operation and post-operation. This is all driven by his character, how he actually wants the patient to be handled. There is a personality involved, personal trait involved, personal touch involved. But when it comes to the, but my, this is not actually the physical operation, the surgery. When it comes actually to the surgery, more or less every surgeon actually does a surgery with minor variations in the techniques. And this is all happening in a closed theater, operation theater. On the other hand, you now come to advocacy. Now, advocacy is firstly, everything is out in the open. The courtroom is a public place. The arguments that you advance before a court, the arguments that you place for the consideration of the judge is the other side is listening and the other side is actually hearing. And 
also your client is also he may be present and there are your colleagues who are also present so in a public place you are performing on behalf of your client and specifically if you take for example a criminal trial there could be very good advocates to prosecute the particular case or to defend the accused in either way every one of them will study the papers think about the case reflect on how to approach it and ultimately will come to the court and present the case in the best possible manner that what the particular advocate feels that is best suited for the particular case and this is true whether it is a civil case whether it is a criminal case or if it is a family dispute or it's a commercial dispute whatever may be the nature of the dispute that is why when we say that there are very good advocates in the profession everybody has got his own style style every advocate is differently from others because that may be his trademark now to begin with when i talk of actually effective art of advocacy the first thing is as i said that the advocate, the advocate ought to be comfortable with his own way of doing things now if you have personality of your own you have your own style and attitude how to deal with this not only deal with the case but also deal with the witnesses whom you are going to actually examine or cross examine how you are going to actually present your case before the judge how you do it with the judge these are all reflective of the personality and the character so therefore your own trait and a character plays a very very important role in advocacy and by the way everybody every advocate whoever i have come across has a particular style of opening the case presenting the case and then as things go on develops the case for the consideration of the judge all these things as i said earlier also they are all done in public that is in a public place so your client may be watching your colleagues are watching and when your colleagues watch they know what professional blunder is being committed in case if one commits a blunder these are all very very important points one should be conscious of when you actually present your case then court room it is not that everything is constant it's a fast facing world it's a fast moving world as things actually unfold suddenly you think that you are the best of the case you may be caught in first sense which one may be find it difficult to answer at that point of time so therefore what we do as an advocate we have to actually when preparing we have to think of the best points we have to think of the bad points and we have to think of the points which the other side may put across questions which the judge may throw at us throw at us now all these issues have to be given a very very deep consideration when we prepare the case you have to master the facts there is no quarrel about that one has to be absolutely sure about the facts then about the law you have to actually do your research you have to actually know as to what is the law what is the statute law or what is the judge made law what is the law on this issue everything one has to be absolutely thorough i have seen even the senior advocates and the best of advocates always read the bar acts the constitution even when know that this is the particular provision and they are actually sure about it but even then they never actually mind touching the book again reading you read it once you read it second time a different interpretation a different impression you may gather similarly over a period of time when you keep reading the same section the same provision you come across ideas you come across arguments you come across logical reasoning that automatically flow from you so therefore a deep reading is essential and it has to be an effective reading and in the court as i said you have to anticipate the improbables what is going to be thrown at you when you actually grow in the profession become senior advocates and you have actually sufficient experience always one can say 
one can foresee as what is going to come. And that is what the art of advocacy is. Best of advocates, they respect this. They understand the imperative of the moment. They are all alert to the needs and they are flexible to change the momentum of the case. The moment actually they feel that something is being thrown at them. You never quite know what answer you will give at that point of time or the way in which the particular piece of evidence is sought to be interpreted by the other side or by the judge. Now, anticipating all these improbables, unable to predict as to what form that improbability will take. Now, these, all these things, of course, will come over a period of time with experience. Now, let me give an example little away from actually the profession of advocacy, I will give you a small example from the history to demonstrate what persuasiveness, that is art of persuasion, is. We all know that the Second World War was fought. Germany had annexed most of Europe and they were actually ruling the Rose. The Allied they were having a serious time. They were having a very, very tough time trying to free Europe in the process of the Nazi rule. Now, when the Battle of Normandy was launched, I am actually going to say what actually was told by the Chief Justice of England and Wales in one of the lectures that Lord Chip actually delivered at the Singapore Law Academy. Now, when the Battle of Normandy was, there were three different commanders. Now, the first commander, Actually said to the troop, remember one thing was common at that time. That is when the troops were launched, they had one thing in common. That was the fear and the apprehension that anything can happen. In such a scenario, the first commander told his troops, I quote, look to the left of you, look to the right of you. There is only going to be one of you left after the first week in Normandy. This is the first commander says, unquote. The second commander, he says to his troops, what you are going through for the next few days, you won't want to go through it very often. For most of you, this is going to be the first time you are going into combat. Remember that you are going to for a kill or you will get killed, unquote. This is actually the commander telling his troops, the second commander. Now the third commander, he pulls out a large commando knife, flashes it, and tells his troops, quote, before I see the dawn of another day, I'm going to stick this knife into the heart of the meanest, the filthiest, and the dirtiest Nazi in Europe, unquote. Now, three different commanders in their own individual style, have approached the problem and they have told troops what is actually going to happen. The first commander, in fact, was realistic in his approach because the fear and apprehension was not unfounded. The casualties, as the history now shows, is enormous. So therefore, he was being very practical. Look to your right and look to your left and you do not know who one out of the three will survive. Being very realistic. That is one sort of an approach. The second approach, the commander, the second, he actually took it as an adventure that though he is going in for combat, he said, this is actually what it would be. And the third commander was absolutely unrealistic because flashing a knife and trying to inflict it in the heart of a Nazi, it is not that simple. In any case, when they were actually trying to rest France on the Battle of Normandy, there were no Germans there. The Germans actually, they were all conquered in Berlin. So there was no immediate threat there of the Germans. See the approach. Each had a different approach. And because each actually was speaking the way what they thought that the war is going to be fought. Now bring it to advocacy. Now, let us actually apply this situation to art of advocacy. Now, when the case comes to you, 
you will actually study it and then you will work out a plan for yourself which you would feel is the best possible manner would secure the relief for your client. Now, therefore, an advocate cannot be anybody else other than his own man. He cannot be somebody else. He cannot be trained to advocate in a way that it is not reflection of his own or her personality. Now, therefore, when you actually look into the possible things of advocacy, you prepare the matter, actually get ready with the matter. <clears throat> when you go to the court and then present it, there is something actually, the third element of effective speaking comes in. To present it in a manner that is logical, that is appealing to the judge, that is in consonance with the law, and most importantly, you present it in a manner that it appeals to the judge. Very, very important. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you have put in your best foot forward. You have presented the case in the best possible manner. You have also done your best and your client is immensely satisfied. Ultimately, when the judgment comes, you may win, you may not win. That is not in none of our hands. If you have made marks in presenting the case, definitely that would have gone somewhere in the corner of the judge, the heart of the judge. He knows here is a man who knows his job, who knows the law, who knows the facts, who is thoroughly prepared, comes prepared to the court, and he is willing to assist the court in the administration of justice. Now, that goes a long way so far as your own individual career is concerned. Because every case that you handle, it's a sort of an investment. The judges often hear them telling us that they do discuss amongst the judges as to how advocates are performing. Like we also discuss about the judges outside. It's very important that when we present the code craft, the manner in which the presentation is done, it's extremely important. You actually look at the court if possible and even engage the judge, the eye of the judge. Speak very, very clearly. That's very important. Then modulate your voice. You also remember that your voice is an important weapon, as I said earlier. The speed with which you speak, then occasionally, when you are losing the court's attention, you just drop your voice don't shout at the judge or the court. These are all may appear very, very elementary. When you have to put it into practice, it becomes very, very difficult for the simple reason one enters the courtroom with the flow of things, what is actually taken away in no point of time. Because what you would have thought, this is the way I would argue the matter. This is the way I would present the particular fact or the particular judgment, you would be swept, swept away, maybe swept away by the things, by the way actually the interpretation is sought to be given by the other side. So one has to be very, very careful. Now also, while doing this, you have to keep extremely, that is extremely important, you have to be alert all the times. You are in the court, you should have the ability to listen and listen very, very calmly and very deeply as to what is happening. When you are examining a witness, for example, the cross-examination is on, maybe a very, very tough witness to crack. He is actually trying to be evasive, coming out with the truth which you know. When you are cross-examining him, don't actually, without knowing what is the effect which it will produce, very important because if it is a very hard nut to crack be of any help to you so far as putting the case is concerned. But at the same time, whenever the witness is under cross-examination, you give a pass at the appropriate time, the witness automatically maybe in his exuberance to actually give some sort of an explanation may come out with something which would die the answer. So therefore, 
very important that one has to be extremely attentive to imports. Similarly, we should not be buried deeply into the books in the court. We have to observe as to what is happening around. The other side may be arguing. The judge may be putting questions after questions. At some point of time, the other side may not be in a position to readily answer as to what is actually being put to him. It's very important. That means that's a point which the judge is going to ask you also an answer on the same issue. Therefore, what the judge is speaking, what the witness is speaking, and what the other side is speaking <laughs> is very all important. It's all important because unless and until you are attentive in the courts or attentive to what is happening around, we will miss a very big opportunity to shape up the presentation of facts that which otherwise we might think that it is actually in my kitty. It doesn't happen that way. So therefore, it is also very important that we need to be very, very attentive. As I said, apart from being attentive, it's also important that one has to listen, listen, listen as to what is actually being said. Practice Definitely, you will not miss the important aspects or the important moments of the case. And again, this all comes over a period of time, learned by experience, never actually forget to give a pass. If you have a good, slightly complex legal point, many a time it happens. The case facts may be very good, but law may be extremely tough. It may be against you. So you will have to develop the proposition in support of your case. And when you do that, we may be actually trading into a very, very complex area. So therefore, when you are advancing, you actually allow time to the judge to think as to what you are actually putting across for the consideration of the judge. This is again very important. Let it sink in the mind of the judge. Otherwise, you don't give him actually time to work don't give the judge to mull over, keep on repeating as to what you are actually placing for consideration may not actually go down very well. And the proposition or the law point which actually you want to actually put across may not even sink in the mind of the judge. Therefore, giving a pass very often is very important. And similarly, that goes for the witness also. As I said, if you give a pass when the witness is under examination, unwittingly, he may actually come out with something which may help your case. So therefore, giving a pass while you are actually speaking in the court is again very important. These are all various attributes of advocacy. Let me give an example again as to what Justice Gore had said before the Singapore Act. Law Academy. One of the great advocates in those days was an Irishman called James Cavan. Now, he was appearing before Lord Denning. All of us actually heard of this name, uh, an outstanding judge in the Court of Appeals. On an absolutely hopeless case of a tenant, James was actually <coughs> facing for consideration of Lord Denning. And he knew, actually, heart of heart, he knew that the law is not in his favor. It was loaded against the tenant and it was in favor of the landlord. But nevertheless, he was giving a big shot. Actually, he was having a shot at it. And these were his opening words. I quote, in this case, I appear for an 87-year-old widow whose husband was killed in the last war and she had lived in this house where he left her to go and fight for his country ever since, unquote. What is there in it? 87 years old, husband had gone for war, he died, and he had left the house for her and where she is living. Lord Denning very rightly actually replied, come on, Mr. Kamen, this is a court of law and not a court of sympathy. Now, the Irish advocate, Mr. James, would have immediately reacted. He did not. He gave a long pause. He did not break into the silence. After some time, the Denning actually filled the gap, Lord Denning, 
Sri said, I quote, how old did you say this poor old widow was? That was fabulous advocacy. Because James did not rush through. He did not actually force his way through. Because if he had said something, maybe it might not have clicked. The past allowed Denning, Lord Denning to think as to actually whom at all few months, few more years, that this lady is going to live. So therefore, he gave the order in favor of Advocate James. This is again a very, very subtle ad advocacy. On the other hand, let me give another example. When we go to actually to the courts, we are all pumped up. We know that we have actually a cast iron case. We have actually the case in the fist in our bag. The order is there because no way actually we can be found fault with. And we may actually come to the biggest blunder. Like, for example, one of the advocates, I've read it somewhere. He always used to tell the judge that, look, there are three points I want to argue. It is arguable. Two, the point which is not arguable. And third, which is overwhelming. So obviously, the judge, in fact, reacted. Please tell me the point which is overwhelming. You don't have to do much of labor. And you know what the reply of the advocate was? He said, that is for you to find out. Maybe he thinks that he has outsmarted the judge, but in effect, it was very bad advocacy. It is only nothing but a story. He has not actually put forward what his overwhelming point is. He tried to make a story out of nothing, and in the end, that is what actually advocacy at times can let you down so badly. When we are actually talking about advocacy, we need to, as I said, very clear about the facts, very clear about the law, very clear about how to present the matter before the judge, how to be attentive in a court, when to give a pass, when to listen, and always keep listening to what is happening around. These are all certain traits nobody can miss. And also, expect the unexpected. That's very important. This famous uh, senior advocate, Janak Das, he practices in the Bombay High Court. I happened to read one of the anecdotes which he had actually mentioned in his lecture to the young lawyers. He was a Mr. when he was practicing in Bombay. It was a case about an environmental clearance required for a building. It was something which actually troublesome for them in the sense the building had certain heritage value. So therefore, there was a problem of getting environmental clearance. Of course, they succeeded in the Bombay High Court. The matter actually traveled to the Supreme Court. Senior Advocate Dwarka Das was assisting Mr. Gulam Bahanbati. And on the other side, Mr. Pali Nariman was appearing. This is what actually has been disclosed by Mr. Dwarka Das. Mr. Pali Nariman was to have a conference as he learned later, but for whatever reasons that conference never materialized. So therefore, they just met for half an hour or maybe a little more before the court was to begin. These people did not expect was, they were all talking about the building, they were all talking about the heritage value, the judgment that the Bombay High Court has delivered, all these things were fine. Mr. Fali Nariman had a fantastic, actually, game plan. He had asked, which actually one came to know later, he had called the his clients and he had told them at the 11th hour, please actually, as to how many trees have been planted in this particular area. They all actually tried to give a slip to this particular area thinking that Mr. Fali Nariman may not remember. Before actually the hearings were to begin, he asked how many trees were to be planted. And he also asked for a full loan up actually, a drawing of that particular building with the area where the building is to be done. Everybody was taken by surprise as to why this insistent on this particular aspect. And when the hearing commenced, the first question 
the judges post to Mr. Pali Nariman was that how many trees have been planted and what is the vegetation in the building around in the building around the building. Mr. Pali Nariman was ready with the answer. That shows what a seasoned lawyer would expect from a particular bench as to how actually you expect the unexpected. When everybody was talking about the building, when everybody was talking about the heritage, when everybody was talking about the judgment, he was one person who was looking into the environmental aspect, which was troubling him, and actually then ultimately won the case for the client. This is how actually a lawyer inside a court always, in fact, ready for answering a particular thing which one might have expected or may not have expected, even then one should be alive to the situation. There's another incident told to us by Mr. Ashok Desai, the Leonard Attorney General who passed away. At this point of time, he was the former Attorney General. When he was as a private senior advocate, he was actually appearing for ONGC. We all know this oil rig, actually, which does nothing but pumps out oil from the high seas. Now, the oil rig was on lease from some Italian company. When the lease was about to finish or midway through, there was some problem and they were wanting the machine back and the ONGC was fighting. It was a very smart by Mr. Ashok Desai. He made up the oil rig, few photographs, and the matter was taken up for hearing. We just actually showed it, this oil rig, this clumsy looking machine, it has got nothing. It is all oil all over. The Italians want to take it away. Whereas it is pumping so many liters of crude oil and it is earning so much of exchange for the country. Now, the way this was put, he had actually made a point and that ultimately won the case. That is what actually the matter is about. So therefore, in a own man, in a own way, in a particular characteristic style, is best actually intended to produce results by your client in a own manner is one of the important aspects of advocacy. Coming down to another important aspect, these days, apart from oral submissions, written submissions are also made. Preparing a written submission, Submitting written submissions, which appeals to the judge, because after all, written submission is also some sort of order of persuasion. So therefore, that also has to appeal to the judge. And they call this as skeleton arguments. When we prepare the list of dates and written submissions, one has to be extremely careful again. You have to put in actually a lot of hard work in preparing a written submissions. That is also important. Of course, a written persuasion, when the judge reads, when the judge the written submissions of both the sides, the ultimately decides, you do not know as to how the judge is going to deal with the written submissions. And by the way, a written submission is not something to satisfy your client. It is not to actually feel satisfied that you have put in a lot of actually flowery language. You have actually put in a lot of Efforts in finding case laws, the meat may be missing, the flush may be missing. What is all important as far as your case is concerned, if you don't actually apply your mind and prepare a written submissions, which is as good as your oral submission, covering all aspects of the case, it is actually not even worth the paper on which it is written. So therefore making written submissions is equally important in today's context. Now, one thing which one must always actually understand is preparing a list of dates and preparing a written submissions. These are all very important aspects of advocacy. The list of dates, the moment you actually sit down to read the case, you start making a list of dates. What all has happened, what important dates. And it's very important. Every time actually you read, the file, there is something which you feel have been left out, something which has been actually added, which is not required to be added, something which is totally irrelevant has been. So you keep on pruning that list of dates 
And ultimately, when the times come from arguing the matter, you prepare a list of dates from which you will be able to actually take the judge to the important facets of the case, important aspects, important facts, important documents, and a proper list of dates is made. In fact, that makes the job of the judge also very easy rather than actually trading into the details of so many dates and events and it provides a crisp, clear, crisp events which will facilitate in actually getting an order in your favor. And that goes similarly for written submissions. You put in the same amount of labor that you put in for preparing the oral submissions. When you are in the court, when you are arguing a matter, you know the way actually you put across a particular point with logic, reasoning, law, supported by your judgments, the same way when you prepare the written submissions, of course, in a concise form, you put in the same amount of labor for preparing the written submissions. But one thing, one has to be very, very clear. Just because you are making a written submission, <coughs> you should not actually feel handicapped in advancing oral submissions. If you lay too much of emphasis on written submissions, since I am giving a written submission, therefore, there is no need to argue the matter orally. It will actually kill the advocacy skills. Oral advocacy is as important as written submission is submitted. So therefore, always remember this, that when you make written submissions, to help the judge in adjudicating the matter. At the same time, of course, written submissions are submitted towards the end. Oral submissions, one should not forget, because otherwise, over a period of time, it will kill the oral skills and the advocacy. And also, I would like to actually emphasize one more aspect, and that aspect is, in the course of our practice, we all go through the amount of training under various seniors and the very good, actually, outstanding advocates. This training is extremely important because over a period of time, what is a strong point, what is a weak point, and concentrate on a strong point, and at the same time, never forget to concentrate on the weak point that one would come across. These are all very important aspects of advocacy. This will come only over a period of time when you actually start going up in the ladder. We all may think, can deal with this case, putting all the facts that every advocate will do. Always remember that the and advocates, the good advocates, I won't say bad advocates, their advocacy, their training is imperfect that they have not been able to present the facts or the law properly. So therefore, when you are actually, when you become a successful lawyer, you would have found that you are able to identify those bad points, bad facts, how to neutralize them, how to actually take care, and similarly, how to deal with the strong points on the opponent side, all these things for a period of time. But nevertheless, unless and until you get trained to spot them right from the beginning of your career or during, as we say, as we sail through the career, that one would come across all these issues and one should be prepared to go through them. Now, what is actually an important aspect that ultimately you have all this, you go through, you get trained. It's a very important aspect of advocacy integrity of the lawyer. That's extremely important. Rather, it's out professionally and personally top class. With the top class integrity, one cannot succeed. Why I'm saying this is, integrity is not your personal integrity alone. Integrity is not to mislead the court. Integrity is not to actually, which are ethically wrong are morally wrong, trying to actually speak to the witnesses of the other side, trying to find out ways and means by which you can influence the course of administration of justice. Now, these are all certain issues one should never venture into. It's very important that an advocate has to be 
an advocate of substance. Not only in preparing the case, but in terms of your personal integrity and professional integrity, both have to be top class. After all, as I said earlier, your fellow lawyers, and judges, they all keep talking about your performance, both in and out the court. At times, the judges, they discuss amongst themselves, I am told, about the performance of a advocate, as to how he has presented the case, as to how otherwise his personal character is. These are all very important for a lawyer, and especially for a young lawyer, because you have a huge career ahead of you. And if one has to actually be successful establishing and finding a name for yourself, it's very important that your personal and professional integrity both have to be top class. And another important aspect every advocate should possess, as I said earlier also, to show compassion and respect to your own fellow colleagues, a fellow advocate. We don't have to be just because we are competing against each other in the courtroom. We don't have to be sworn enemies outside. We have to be friendly towards each other. We have to be humane. After all, we are following a noble, noble profession. And the noble profession is only a noble profession in terms of nobility inside the court. Outside also, inside also, your friends, they are approaching you. When your own colleagues, you find that they are distressed, that they are in difficulty, a humane approach and a friendly approach and a warmth with you. You care for them outside, that is equally important. Therefore, in the whole analysis, your personal conduct, your professional etiquette, your professional work, and above all, the simplicity and being humane at all times <coughs> is very, very important. All these facts actually build up from become, to enable you to become one of the seasoned advocates, what actually is the art of advocacy, which is to be practiced. There have been very, very instances where actually people have said advocacy is something to be actually gained overnight. There is no ready-made or a crash course that you can actually get it overnight. It's not a capsule that you just swallow and immediately, in fact, you will become a genius and you will be able to master this art of advocacy. No, it comes over a period of time. It comes not only over a period of time, over years and years of putting in hard work and sincerity and commitment. Lord Atkins said that ultimately, what you have to actually, as a lawyer is, live like a hermit and work like a horse. These two things are very, very important because, let me as we all know, in fact, nothing but actually your own, in fact, profession, the tapas, the manner in which actually you go about, that's very important. A hermit, worldly pleasure, he lives actually all the time thinking about the walk. And second is hard work, walk like a horse. It goes without saying, the hard work is actually the answer for everything. The other day, I was also listening to Mr. Harish Salve, actually. He was on the web platform, setting out his experience before the International Court of Justice, the Kulbushan Jadav case. It was a very, very rich experience that he was sharing with all of us. What is the take so far as the profession is concerned? He said two things. First is hard work and commitment be an answer to this. And second, and most important that he said, always remember that an advocate, as an advocate, you have to actually sell your case to the judge. You sell your ideas to the judge. You have to actually make the judge understand these are the niceties. These are actually all important for that particular case. And therefore, your approach Respect to the institution, 
respect actually to the profession, respect to your colleague, all these things actually go a long way in making you as one of the best of it. I also would like to actually say certain things. When you are in a court, it is not only in fact in the courtroom that you keep actually arguing only the matters, matters, the cases. After all, the other side is a human being. The judge is a human being. The people who are present in a courtroom, they are all human beings. So therefore, what you actually argue, you actually present to the judge, they all show your personality. If you are aggressive, if you are argumentative, if you are actually trying to, so therefore, <clears throat> when you are actually arguing, as I said, if you are argumentative, if you are aggressive, he is a person who may be knowing certain things, but his conduct, his presentation of facts, his presentation may be brilliant, but so far as his personal conduct is concerned, there is a lot which is left to be desired. So that sort of an attitude should not actually get into. Now, I have been in the profession for so many years, combined with the army experience. I can say one thing. Every day is a different day. Good days, there have been not so good days. You keep learning every day when you go to the courts. Rather, the day you go to the court every day, some sort of adrenaline actually rushes in because you know that you are actually planned certain things about your case, about the other activities in the court. So, therefore, it's always a learning every day when you go to the court. In the bargain, you make friends, each one of them better than self. And in this manner, you always live a life, actually gives you a lot of sense. So therefore, as a lawyer, you know, if you take up this profession, and if you are in this profession, you do good to yourself, you good to the community, good to your clients, and do your public service. And in this manner, you will have the satisfaction. Yes, I did it, and I have lived with it, and I'm happy about it. And if you don't want to do it, and if you actually write in the beginning, you are frightened, and if you have a feeling that you may not actually have the guts to actually face this profession, well, of course, one cannot help it. Ultimately, whichever way you actually proceed, favors a lot. You may be hardworking, but if luck doesn't favor you, well, it becomes even harder. So therefore, ultimately, I would actually conclude this by saying, best of luck to you all. And I once again thank Amity, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with everyone. Thank you very much. <coughs> You can ask questions in case they want any question. The viewers are most welcome to throw questions at me, and I will try to endeavor. I, I will endeavor to answer to the best possible manner. Yeah, the question which has been, sir, is it difficult to follow ethics in the profession? As I said, <laughs> integrity is the all important factor in the profession. Your personal integrity and professional integrity both. Ethics have to be practiced morally, legally, you can't go wrong. And ethics is important. That's why ethics is also one of the, in fact, in Advocates Act, if you see in the Bar Council of India rules that has been came for the profession, there is a complete chapter devoted to ethics. Ethics is very important. It's an all important aspect and come what may. It has to be practiced. Then only one can be a successful advocate. What would be your biggest takeaway from your experience? Yes, the hard work and sincerity. I am being very candid. When I resumed my practice after my stint in the army, sort of actually drafting I did. If you have to do drafting, necessarily you have to actually do a lot of research. Drafting a pleading is not that easy. You should know the facts, you should be thorough with the facts, and also you should research 
on what the law is and accordingly you have to develop the base as i said drafting is very important it is fundamental if it is a trial court then it's a original court and therefore the case starts from there if the foundation weak then definitely the drafting in fact is going to have a big say and if the foundation is strong then it becomes very easy even when the matter is carried in appeal so one big takeaway that i was i did lot of drafting and which actually gave me a lot of insight and eventually in fact i could actually build up on how to actually prepare your arguments and so he is asking a question how to develop the drafting skills well drafting skills as i said master the facts that requires extensive reading it requires extensive reading and apart from mastering the facts you have to actually know what the law is as i said the client has come to you with a problem and you have to think in terms of what relief you can get for him what is the fact what is the law on the subject what are the legal grounds on which you will be able to actually fight for him now all these things come only by virtue of extensive reading you have to actually keep on that's why all these journals you have to be in fact keep reading reading you have to make it as a not i won't say hobby it's actually part of your life as an advocate how the shift will take after covid 19 well excellent question the other day in fact uh, justice uh, dhananjay chandrachur the sitting judge of the honorable supreme court he has actually said in future in future slowly slowly will give way to virtual courts that is because of covid 19 even today most of the courts they are actually conducting hearings through video conferencing this is actually going to be a long drawn affair eventually it is possible it is possible i am not saying that it will necessarily happen it is possible that we have to be prepared and we will have to become tech savvy so far as actually the presentation of cases through video conferencing is concerned we have to prepare ourselves for it that is one aspect of it the other aspect of course like all the fields are taking a beating even the practice of the practice of advocacy the profession also will certainly face hard times so far as the covid is concerned it will only time will tell as to how it is going to actually affect this profession <coughs> advocacy is a very long you know it takes years and years the art of advocacy won't come in just like that somebody is asking me a question sir is the art of advocacy isn't it that just by advancing the arguments no 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 no, no. as i said the fundamentals effective reading effective learning effective um, speaking and effective listening all these things comes over a period of time there is no crash course your question is incomplete i couldn't read the question the cases are well versed after that there is choosing judicial services or making a career well both are a part of administration of justice let me put it this way a judge is one wheel of the chariot the advocate is the other wheel if you want to actually go in for a judicial service yes by all means it gives you a very very decent life it gives you status it gives you actually what i would what i should say that it gives you a tremendous satisfaction that you are doing a human public service but yes with less money as compared to a career but career on the other hand is not all that rosy it's not a bed of roses even actually beginning making a beginning itself is so tough even sustaining is also so tough because the clients are very very choosy therefore even if you take law as a career it's very difficult to sustain in the profession so therefore you have lot of challenges <coughs> in some of the proceedings as i can see the complete question Okay, I think Kalmbara, uh, we have exceeded the time. Okay. I think we'll conclude it. Uh, Kalmbara Subhane, I, on behalf of Amity Law School, Amity University, Madhya Pradesh, Bharatiya, thank you very much.